Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of Holy Smoke Cigars and Spirituality. Today, we're coming at you with I Bible, the authority of Scripture. Of course, anytime you get this group talking about the authority of Scripture, you know you're going to get something disruptive, something fun, something thought provoking. And depending on where you are in life, it may piss you off. But nonetheless, we're going to keep pushing forward here at Holy Smokes. I'm Christian A. Smith. I'm the host and the heretic and the pastor of the faith community of Atlanta, the uh, sponsoring church for this particular ministry. So I'm very proud of the work that we are doing. We have an incredible group of people here today who are going to join us for this conversation. And I'm going to get into their introductions here in a moment. Uh, shout out to everybody in our live virtual audience from our Patreon community. Thank you all so much. Ariana Grayson, who is in the audience today because he's not on the cast. We'll see him uh, in a future episode. We got uh, Elder Dewan Bibbs and Callie Cawthon Frills, Jeremiah Jones, so many beautiful people who are here with us today in the live virtual audience. Uh, and we got some people who might show up a little bit later. Also, everybody that listens on the podcast platforms, thank you so much for being here. Now, let me go ahead and do our normal protocol, our church announcement, so to say, we got one rule at Holy Smokes, just one. We don't get into a whole bunch of rule keeping here, but we do have one that's very important. That one rule is that we honor each other's lived experiences. One more time, please. All right, one more time for the truth. One rule at Holy Smokes is that we honor each other's lived experiences. Actually, can we do it one more time? Just one, one more time. Last okay. time, I promise. Last time. <laughs> one rule at Holy Smokes is that we honor each other's lived experiences. Let me tell you why that's so important in case you didn't know or in case you need a reminder. Because many times when we have conversations about life, faith, theology, we tend to lift up our doctrine over somebody else's lived experience. So at Holy Smokes, we challenge people to think about that in reverse. So that when you encounter someone whose lived experience contradicts your doctrine or your theory, you take that as an opportunity to learn from what that person has lived. And that one rule here at Holy Smokes is rooted in greatest commandment theology. Again, this is a brand of theology that I curated during the course of about the past five or six years. It's the basis of the faith community. And it guides a lot of our conversations here at Holy Smokes. Greatest Commandment Theology says this, your love for God is displayed through how you love your neighbor, which is an extension of how you love yourself. Therefore, you can't fully love God if you don't love your neighbor, and you can't fully love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. You can find that in Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 34. Go ahead and take a look at it. You'll enjoy the read. Those are the words of Jesus. I didn't make it up. I just expound on them a little bit. And I did that in a book that I released last year called Breaking All the Rules. Check it out. Go to ChristianASmith.com and pick it up. All right. Let's go ahead and get into these introductions because I'm excited about the crew today. So since we're doing iBible, the authority of scripture, um, this is what I want to do by way of introduction. I want to ask everybody, introduce yourself, tell us. What are you smoking? What are you drinking? And then tell us this. What place does the Bible hold in your life? What place does the Bible hold in your life? I'll start because I'm going to give the cast a little bit of time to think about it because I know they're sitting there thinking, please don't ask me first. So I'm going to give you all these next 60 seconds to get your thoughts together because I'm coming your way. And I'll give you a heads up right now. Nikki, you first. So <laughs> I am having a, a, a new stick today. I'm having the Alec Bradley Black Market. All right. And I'm enjoying this. Alec Bradley always makes quality sticks. So this is my first time having this one. I'm enjoying it. And today for my beverage, it's a little bit cooler today than it normally is. So I'm doing a mix. If you're a bourbon purist, You'll probably hate the stuff that I drink because I don't always drink it neat. I don't always drink it on the rocks. I tend to mix stuff sometimes. 
I have an infinity bottle with like 17 different bourbons in it. That's just how I roll. Today, I'm having a mix of Michter's small batch and I put some Knob Creek smoked maple in it to kind of break it a little bit. And I mean, the Knob Creek smoked maple is still 90 proof, but that little bit of sweetness kind of breaks it up a little bit. So that's what I'm having for my beverage. I'm going to sip that slow. And uh, the question for today is what place does the Bible hold in your life? For me, the Bible is sacred, not sovereign. The Bible is sacred, not sovereign. It shows me a story of how a particular people group related to God and related to each other. And it helps me to see what we can learn from their experience. Uh, so that is the place the Bible holds in my life. We're going to kick it over to Nikki, the anchor. Let her introduce herself. Go ahead, Nikki. Hey everybody, I'm Nikki Hardiman. They do call me the anchor. Um, and it's so good to be with all of you today. Uh, it is chilly out today, so I'm not smoking because I'm inside, but I'm sipping on a little um, vodka and soda tonight with a little squeeze of lime in it. Just simple and clean tonight. Um, the question, um, so it depends on the time of my life that you ask me. The Bible has held lots of different places in my life, but there is one thing that I always go back to. Um, no matter how I read it, no matter my relationship with it, when I read the Bible, I go back to something my dad, who was a pastor, taught me. And he said that the Bible essentially teaches us about relationships. It teaches us about our relationship to God, our relationship to ourself, our relationship to one another, and our relationship to creation. And that is a helpful framework through which I approach reading scripture. That's the thing that's been steady all the way through. I love it. That's great. And I'm sure that's very helpful to a number of people. I'm sure for a lot of people that will help to anchor them in their <laughs> beliefs. <laughs> Let's kick it over to Karima the truth. Karima, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, hey, hey. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you find yourself watching this podcast. My name is Karima Akila. Around here, they call me The Truth. And tonight, I am sipping on some good old Reprezato, um, some uh, tequila, some 1921, with my uh, slightly muddled cucumber with a salt rim because it's just been that kind of day. So for me, uh, the, the Bible and I have a very uh, entangled relationship, if you will. I go back to my high school Bible teacher. His name was Dr. Reem. May he rest in peace. Dr. Reem used to say to us uh, that the Bible cannot contradict itself and that if you come across something that appears to be a contradiction, then it is a, an oxymoron. And I remember looking at him thinking, okay, the mere nature of that word sounds crazy, but okay. So right now, uh, the Bible and I are in a very unique, interesting place. Um, and it is, it, is, it is one that I do. It is a book that I reference. It is, I have my favorite Bible sitting right there. And I'm, you can find passages that are underlined and there are parts of it that I hold very near and dear. However, in recent years, I have come to see it as a book of reference, not necessarily one that Dr. Reem would surely not prove of me using it in that way. So I'm very much looking forward to this conversation to help me narrow down just where I am with the Bible. You know, we used to be, you know, that used to be my boo, but you know, now we kind of on the outs a little bit. We're trying to figure it out. Yes, it, it is complicated. I'll take that. That's fair. That is fair. I mean, I think a lot of people are in that place, Karima. Uh, Ariana, uh, who's with us in the live virtual audience, said it's, uh, it's complicated and we're taking it slow type <laughs> of relationship. Yes. And I can nice. definitely appreciate that. Pamela said, that was, that was something Pamela said that cracked me up. For me, it's like the irritating auntie that talks shit unnecessarily, but always drops major, major wisdom. <laughs> I love it. I love it. 
All right, let's keep it going. I'm going to have Myron the Mystic introduce himself next. Go ahead, Myron. Well, good afternoon, morning, evening, whatever, folks, whenever y'all watching this. Myron the Mystic here. Um, I'm inside just like everybody else. I'm not smoking anything uh, and I'm behaving tonight. I'm drinking green tea. I got some work to do after we record, so I'm drinking green tea. And boy, you know, this show goes a lot slower when you're drinking green tea. I feel focused. <laughs> like I've got answers in my head. I don't think I'm gonna say anything crazy tonight, knock on wood. This stuff just wonders, I tell you. Uh, in my relationship with the Bible, I, uh, I appreciate the book as a platform. And what I mean by that is this, you have never heard somebody say they're in love with Match.com. They appreciate the fact that Match.com has connected them and made a relationship happen for them, but they never fall in love with the platform. And so I appreciate the Bible because it's introduced me to the God of the Bible, uh, but it's just a platform to connect me to him or her or the divine. Mic drop? That was the green tea. No, no, that was the green tea. <laughs> See, was... Myron, I'm sick of you, man. It's the green tea. I'm telling you. This I'm stuff sick. is good. I'm sick of you. Like, I, I got to get you out of my church. This is not going to end well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my... My ego's too big to have you on the team. Like, one of us got to go. Listen, I can't do the stuff you do, though. I mean, I went to a funeral once, and Christian got up and sung at the funeral, and oh, nobody God. needed to preach after he sung. And I said to myself, well, I'll be damned. This is the best funeral I've ever been to. And somebody was dead. <laughs> okay. Wait a minute. The Wait. best. Wait a minute. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. Okay, wait a minute. Oh God, wait a. You He's laughing because this is a true story, and he knows he sung the house down. Okay, he said, and somebody was dead. I was like, this is this is better than a boys to men concert. <laughs> okay, wait. We got to keep going. We got to keep going. I'm sorry. Come on back. Come on back. <laughs> Okay. And on green tea. Okay. Right. Green tea. No cavassier. No douce. This is green tea. So apparently, what you have to drink has nothing to do with how you act. That's what's becoming apparent in this moment. <laughs> All right. This last introduction. I'm really excited because we have a new recurring cast member this season. She made her uh, premiere last season on the the cannabis episode. And she's been adding so much insight. Was it season two you're on the cannabis episode? I don't remember. But she made an appearance on the cannabis episode last season. She came and talked to us about pro ho theology. She's one of our producers. She does all the things. Her name is Tyranny Jordan. Tyranny, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, friends. Um, like you said, I'm Tyranny Jordan. They call me at and I just want to say it's my first recurring episode. And y'all going to make me go after Myron after he done just said all of those wonderful things about his relationship with the Bible and brought it together all nice. It sounds like a setup to me, but I'm going to go for it. I am not um, smoking or drinking anything tonight. Um, and my relationship with the Bible, I'm more so um, along the lines of Karima and Ariana in the chat. We got a complicated relationship. We be going back and forth. And so like when I think about the Bible, I think about um, people who say, if, if I ask you what your favorite book is, and you say the Bible, I can't trust you anymore because that either means you don't read it or like you don't have critical thought. Like, so one of these is going on. You either ain't reading it or you're not critically engaging. And so that quote, along with the it's complicated and we be we be going back and forth in a struggle kind of sums up how I feel about the Bible. You sound like somebody who's finishing up a Masters of Divinity. It sounds just like somebody who just went to seminary. <laughs> Let me live, okay? <laughs> no, because I was there too. I, I get it. And I'm still there. Don't get me wrong. I think all of us have some overlap in how we see the Bible. I don't think, I think we, we all presented it differently, but we all have some overlap. Well, that's the crew. So you can see this is going to be 
a very thought provoking and riveting conversation tonight. But this is holy smokes, cigars and spirituality. So we can't go any further without giving you today's cigar tip. And this person who's bringing it tonight made her debut on the cigar tip last season. We love her. We call it an anchor. So we're going to right now give you the anchor's cigar advice. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here sharing with you the Anchor Cigar Advice. So as many of you know, I am probably the newest to cigar smoking on the cast or one of the newest, um, but I have embraced it. I enjoy it um, and I have enjoyed learning about it. Um, but I will say there's a lot that it takes to get started. You need a cutter and you need a good lighter and you need to buy cigars and you need to be able to store your cigars. Uh, and so I started looking around about how to do that. And I wanted to be able to get a good humidor because that's what um, you, you keep your cigars in. Uh, but also, quite frankly, it wasn't in the budget um, because I have lots of other things I want to buy. Um, and so I learned that a very good airtight Tupperware will do the trick until I am ready to research humidors and get one that works for me. So you just need a Tupperware that um, that is airtight and it can hold your cigars. And then as you have been shown, you put one of these in there and it'll help keep the humidity where it needs to be to keep your cigars um, right at the humidity that they need to be. So get you a good um, Tupperware, something that's airtight, um, and use that to take care of your cigars until you can really um, research and get a humidor that you feel good about having. That was I love it. Great advice, because I get that question all the time, like. Because people want to, you know, mm -hmm. get more than one cigar at a time, but they know they're not going to smoke it really right. soon. That's great I'm advice. One of those. I don't often smoke on my own. It is almost always with someone else, and so I'll accumulate them and have them, and then I need to be able to keep them. So, yeah. Great advice. Thank you, Nikki, the anchor. That was awesome. Okay, now let's get into it. I Bible the authority of Scripture. This is going to be good because the church has a very interesting relationship with the Bible. Interestingly enough, for a lot of people, um, we, we treat the Bible as if it fell straight from heaven and it was signed, sealed, delivered by God themselves and that there's no need to question it. There's no need to critique it. There's no need to ask any questions of it. We're just supposed to do what it says and don't ask any questions. And that type of thinking has led to movements like Holy Smokes. It has led to ministries like the faith community. Uh, it has led to a number of ministries uh, that are similar to this. Uh, so it's always an interesting topic. And we, we tackled this a little bit in season one when we got started, but it's always good to revisit it. I know for me personally, um, I sometimes forget just how unique this community is because we talk in these terms every time we get together. But there are a lot of people for whom this type of conversation is foreign, like absolutely foreign to even broach this type of topic. So what I want to do is, is get started in this way, because there is this understanding in many faith traditions uh, that the Bible is inerrant and infallible. Um, if you've heard that before, you know what I'm talking about, that the Bible is inerrant. There are no errors. It's infallible. It can't be wrong. It can't be questioned. So I just want to go ahead and throw that out to this cast and, and see what are you all's thoughts on that, the inerrancy and infallibility of Scripture. And since it's her first time as a recurring member on the cast, I'm going to kick it over to AT&T because I'm sure with her being fresh off that M deal, she has a number of things to share with us. Tyranny, what do you think about 
the inerrancy and infallibility of scripture concept. Again, it feels like a setup. But <laughs> um, when I think about the inerrancy and infallibility of scripture, I'm reminded of the episode we did where Nikki said, sometimes you just need to call stuff bullshit. And I don't, I, that's how I feel about it, inerrancy and infallibility of the Bible. I don't think that you can say that there's no errors, that there's nothing in there that contradicts itself. Because as you said, this isn't something that was just dropped into our laps. Humans had a hand in curating and crafting and putting it together. So therefore it has to have flaws. Therefore it has to have something in there that reflects the humanity of the people who curated it. And so I feel like if we're going to talk about the authority of scripture, we can do that. We can talk about the place that it has in our lives, but to put out a blanketed statement that says, oh, this can't be wrong. There's nothing here that you need to question. Just take it at surface value. That's harmful. That's dangerous. So like we, we can't do that. I'm calling I'm calling bullshit. All right. So you said she's calling bullshit. I think it's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that, that some people will uh, rebut that statement with like, well, the Bible is inerrant in its original form. They'll talk about the original signatures, like, you know, that, that, that is actually inerrant and perfect. But then the reality is we don't have access to that. So we're calling something inerrant that we've never seen or experienced, but then we're applying it to the thing that we have in our hand. It's really interesting how people come to that conclusion and are constantly making those arguments. Karima, I, I really love uh, hearing your thoughts on this because you're a highly educated individual, but you didn't go to seminary, right? You just been in church for a long time. <laughs> so you got a lot of church experience and, and you're a very intelligent individual. What do you think about inerrancy and infallibility from your perspective? So the word or the phrase absolute truth is what comes to mind. And the remember there was a whole documentary out that the evangelical church was pushing about the need for absolute truth. And then that is really where I've begun to unravel, pull that thread and unravel that with this question, why? Why must the Bible be considered absolute? And truthful and and lacking of any fallacy or errors. And that is because I think it's rooted in this need to be superior than others. It's rooted in this need to be able to condemn others and therefore elevate oneself. Um, and it is something that for a long time I subscribed to. I told you, I sat in Dr. Reams' class during my 11th and 12th grade years where he hammered down our throats that the Bible cannot contradict itself, that it cannot be found in error because I got the feeling that they knew that once you began to pull on that thread, that the whole thing would unravel and therefore you're left with what? So um, I, I always question, why is it so? Why the need to stamp out any type of room for the Bible to be anything other than absolute truth? And when I began to pull on that thread, what I saw at the end of that tapestry is something that is broader, something that is more encompassing. And I saw actually um, the beauty of the errors. The beauty of the errors. Mm -hmm. I think that's mic drop worthy, just that statement alone. What if we shifted the paradigm to appreciate the beauty of the errors? Wow. That's really good. Myron, I know you have some thoughts. I certainly do, right? So uh, these words inerrant and infallible, uh, I think are twins, but they're not the same. Uh, and we use them interchangeably all the time, but I don't think we can use them that way. So let me start here. I don't think the Bible is inerrant. I think we find errors in the text like Isaiah 40 and 22 that suggests that the earth is flat. It says something like the Lord sits on the corners of the earth. It's the earth ain't flat. They didn't know any better. That's that's an error. 
uh, it's a mistake. If you look at the history of translation, you'll see there are even spelling errors. You know, in the, I grew up in the black church. Uh, in the black church, we call it the Holy Ghost. You know where that came from? That was a spelling error. That was an error in interpretation. It's, it, it really was the Holy Spirit. Ghost meant ghoul, which meant scary, while spirit meant something that was friendly and something you could associate with. So uh, that's an error. Uh, so I do not think that the Bible is an error, uh, or inerrant rather, but I do think it's infallible. Uh, and here's what I mean when I say the word infallible. So I think it's trustworthy and it will not fail in its purposes as a guide to life and salvation. So if you are looking for a guide to connect you to the divine, if you are looking for a guide to, to lead you uh, back to heavenly purposes, I think you can use the Bible for that and it won't fail in those purposes. So it's infallible in that way, but I do not think that it's inerrant. <laughs> I knew he was going to do that. I knew that was coming. Y'all are too kind with these horns. I appreciate this. I, I wish I had horns in my real life. I had a meeting yesterday, and I knew I said something powerful. The whole room went silent. I was like, in my mind, I was like, boo, 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 boo. <laughs> in your head, the air my horns head, were playing. In my head. I was looking at the dean going, boo, 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 boo. <laughs> You know, so I think I think that your response to infallibility is loaded. And we've had this conversation privately because I think that there's so many layers to the, the dependability of Scripture, because depending on how you come at it, I think the paradigm from which you approach the Bible will determine its dependability. And, and so I, I go back to the words of, of Pete Enns, uh, who's a, a Bible scholar who's written a number of great books that have been very inspirational for me. He says, the Bible isn't the problem. The problem is the unrealistic expectations we bring to the Bible that it was never meant to bear. And I believe when we come to the Bible with unrealistic expectations, we cancel out its potential infallibility. So I don't disagree with you. I don't necessarily make the same argument. I don't know where I am. I'm just kind of like, uh. But keep in mind, I gave you my approach to the scripture in the beginning. I told you it's a platform. So it's not going to fail in being a platform to connect you to the divine. Exactly. So, so you look at it as a platform. So that's your paradigm. Mm-hmm. Right. So in order to make an infallibility argument, we have to take a step back and understand the paradigm. You look at it as a platform while other people look at it as the thing with which to be in love, which I think is the problem with how infallibility has been presented for generations now. That's what happens when you think the Bible is the word of God. You know, oh, oh God, because I, <laughs> I, I don't think the Bible is the word of God. I think it, it contains is the word of God It's in there somewhere. But that's it's the not Bible the Bible tells us what the word of God is. And yes. it ain't the Bible. Yes. So, Nikki, <laughs> please <laughs> expound. No, go. it's it's on you anyway. So in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word of God is Jesus. According to the Gospels, the word of God is not, I've got to hold a Bible for this. The word of God is not the Bible. The word of God is the person of Jesus Christ that came to earth, incarn God incarnate, God with us. That is the word of God, not this. This leads us to, this shows us that word of God, but this isn't the word of God. Okay, y'all bringing the heat today. So I, I have a question about that. I like that. that. That is helpful because when we point people to Jesus, then that helps us to kind of, you know, narrow this down and bring more focus to it. My challenge there is that many times we push people to Jesus in name only. 
So even in our explanation of Jesus as the word of God, what that does is that gives people a pass to just declare the name of Jesus and apply it to whatever bullshit they want to do, which is how you get people storming the Capitol saying Jesus is my king. How you get people saying lock the kids up at the border and separate them from their parents while saying Jesus is my king. So that is, is a challenge that I have. And, and T, I would love to hear what you think about the concept of Jesus being the word and Jesus being God incarnate. Go, go ahead and tell us what you think, because I want to hear it. Um, I don't know. I'm still I'm still pondering and thinking, thinking through it and processing and things. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me is um, I, I believe that we should focus on the way of Jesus. I think we should live our lives according to the way that Jesus lived while Jesus was on earth. But I think that oftentimes that's not the part of Jesus we're focusing on. We're focusing on the Jesus that's on the cross and we're focusing on crucifixion all the time. And when we think about the word of God being Jesus, it looks a lot like suffering. It looks a lot like pain. It looks a lot like all of those things that are wrapped up in that image of Jesus on the cross. Because, you know, without no resur without the resurrection, what are we doing here? Like, you know, that's kind of the whole point of the foundation of the faith. And so I think that we focus so much on that part of the life of Jesus that we don't necessarily focus on the way of Jesus. And so that's the first thing that kind of like comes up for me as I'm thinking about Jesus as the word of God and what does that mean and how should we like approach or apply it. So I don't know if I'm for it or against it. I'm still, I'm still thinking. And that's cool. I, I appreciate that. And that should be a, a lesson to anybody who's watching or listening that you don't have to have it all figured out. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest disservices uh, the church has done to people is by convincing us we have to be sure of everything, that uncertainty is wrong. Again, going back to Peter Hens, he wrote a book called The Sin of Certainty, that to, to assume that you have all the right answers is a sin in and of itself. Mark Twain put it this way, it's not what you don't know that gets you in the trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And it's a whole lot of people who know the Bible is inerrant and infallible for sure. No doubt in their mind. And the reality is that just ain't so. <laughs> it just ain't so. But I got a question. Myron, help me. I'll take it. That was well deserved, too. I'll take it any day of the week. I got to do my little bop when I get my little air horns. I appreciate it. Uh, I got a question with this whole concept of the Bible's not the word of God. The Bible contains the word of God. Jesus is the word. So, Myron, parse that out for us a little bit. The Bible contains the word. Like, so wh where else might we find the word if the Bible isn't the word? Oh, I think the word is in the Bible. And, and here's... Josh Carpenter, you did this. He put the words Karl Barth in the in the chat. So uh, I, let me bring up some technical terms. Matter of fact, true story. Um, my glasses are inspired by uh, that great theologian Karl Barth. Uh, he uses this term, and I, I'm going to define it, y'all. So hang out with me. Uh, diastasis, uh, which simply means distance. That there is distance between the Word of God and the biblical text. And that there are things that separate us from the word and the text, or that's a, that's in between the word and the text. And let me tell you what those things are. One, it's it's people, the people that wrote the text that have a viewpoint and a vantage point uh, that they bring to the text as it is written. It is cultural. They have a culture that they bring to the text that they wrote, uh, and we've got to parse out that culture before we find what the kernel of truth. Uh, which is a, a term by uh, Von Harnack uh, that is in the text, right? You've got to parse your way through the things that separate the word of God from the biblical text so that ultimately you can find what the word is. 
Carpenter did that for me. He said he said the words Carl Bart. So I figured, oh, that's a helpful way to talk about this. No, nah, I'm jealous. I'm making a rule now that Myron gets no more air horns until I catch up. I'm going to need at least 15 air horns before he gets his next one, because that's how far behind I am. And I don't like it. If you sing like you sung at that funeral, we'll give you all the air horns right now. I cut off my internet and watch from the Facebook group, brother. No, I want to get air horns for saying profound stuff, not for singing. <laughs> you you sing get profound. profound too. <laughs> no, I, I I think that's good. I like that a lot. Um, I'm still wondering, you know, because we're talking about the authority of the Bible, the authority of Scripture. Um, are there any other places where we might find the word of God? Karima, do you have any thoughts on that? Have you seen the word of God anywhere outside of the Bible? I sure have. I'm sitting in it right now. I'm sitting in it. This, Talk to us. This is the word of God right here. <laughs> and so, you know, as, as you guys were, were talking about that, you know, where I am right now, in my relationship to uh, to how I view Christ and the Word of God, Christ is no different from me. I am the embodiment of the Word of God. When I sit on my mat, which is right here, it's a little folded up right now, and I go into meditation, I am communing with the divine because that is what I am. That is who I am. And so I am the Word of God walking. I am just divinity having a human experience as we all are. So in that instance, I am the word of God. All right, I'm censoring Karima's air horns too now, because between the two of them, this is y'all making me sick. Y'all are making me sick. No, I, I love it. The whole concept that we are divinity, having a human experience, that we are created in the image of God. I think that goes back to greatest commandment that in order for you to learn how to love God, you gotta learn how to love yourself. That if God created us in God's image, then in order for us to truly love God, we have to learn how to love and appreciate ourselves. We have to understand that God's word resides in us. It resides in our lived experiences, which is why that's the one rule here. I can't take away from Karima's lived experience. I don't care what I read in the scriptures. I don't care what the Apostle Paul said in any of his epistles. I cannot take his writing and use that to discredit what Karima has lived or what Nikki has lived or Myron or Tyranny. And that is the power of understanding an expanded view of what the word of God is. And I think we need to like, reconcile that within ourselves. So my, my question then becomes, how can we healthily engage the Bible? Because what I'm hearing from everybody here is that we've experienced a number of religious settings where people engage the Bible in a very unhealthy way, where we look at it as something other than, as Myron put it, the platform but we look at it as something we can't question, which is just crazy to me. We look at it as something that never has any contradictions. Like how do we healthily engage the Bible? Nikki, do you have any thoughts on a healthy way to engage the Bible? I knew you were gonna come to me first. Um, so, how to helpfully engage the Bible. So I grew up Baptist. I'm still a Baptist. Um, and being Baptist is something that won't let me go, um, even when I want it to. And when it comes to scripture, Baptists have this belief that we have this belief that a lot of people know priesthood of the believers, where we are all priests into our, to ourselves and we can connect with God. We don't need anybody in between us. We also have this um, historical freedom, sola scripture, that we can all come to scripture and read it and interpret it for ourselves. And I think that's the key. We cannot, it's not an advocacy to interpret scripture on our own, 
but it is to interpret it for ourselves and bring that to the community. Um, and so when we take the time to sit and read it and see where our life intersects it, to um, there's more to it than this, but for me, that's foundational. Read it for yourself. Don't listen. Listen to other people, but take time to listen to what you hear in scripture and where it meets you, where you are at. Scripture has, it's one of those things that has the ability to speak to us, even when we don't always know how to listen. Um, that, that's kind of what I've got right now. I, I lean into my Baptistness with this. Um, I think it's really important that we see where it meets us. Um, and then we check that out with the larger community of faith that we trust. I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. The thing that that concerns me is that for a lot of us, when we have gone to scripture for ourselves, we were submitted to leadership that had the whole absolute truth uh, theory. And then we would ask those people, you know, can you help me understand this? And what happens is because they are required to approach it with a level of certainty, they won't admit when they don't know. Hmm. That Yeah, no, I hear that. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, but one thing that I, I didn't really answer the infallibility and errancy question. I'm not going back to that. But one thing I wanted to say with that, and it informs this question, is that I'm with all of you on this infallibility and errancy. Like, it's, it's such a reductionist way to look at the Bible. But um, the Bible is full of stories of fallible people who God used. Uh -huh. And so I can take comfort in knowing that even in my own fallibleness, I can trust myself to read this and understand it. Yes, you can go and talk to people who have studied it and they know all the academic things, but I can trust myself to read this text and engage with it. And so can each one of you. And so can everyone who's listening. If you want to engage with it, just do it. Just pick it up and read it and see where it speaks to you. I agree. And, and I believe also that when you read it for yourself, because what we're talking about has has been labeled as like the deconstruction movement, like actually reading it for what it says mm -hmm. rather than reading into it what we were told it says. And I think that the my, my warning to people who are going through a process of deconstruction is that this is not an activity in which you can engage in isolation. Right. But these conversations need to be had in community. So yes. yes, read it for yourself and then get with a community of people that are reading it alongside of you. And then you can hear what they got from it from their perspective because of their lived experience. And then as a community, we can come to some type of consensus. We can boil it down to some level of basic truth by taking into account everybody's lived experience. But if you only read it in isolation, mm. you're going you to be in trouble every right. time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because you're... Yeah. And I would add that while we have that responsibility to read it for ourselves and where it intersects with us, we don't get anywhere close to what it means without the community because yeah. you need all of those perspectives to have a full understanding. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I want to respond to one of our, our patrons in the virtual audience because this came up in the chat. If you don't know, if you're listening right now, it goes down in the chat at Holy Smokes. Like we could be having a conversation on screen and the virtual audience is on a totally different subtopic. And they're not listening to a word that we say. <laughs> but no, I so appreciate the engagement with the topic. Um, Jeremiah Jones asked a moment ago, what do we do with uh, 2 Timothy 3.16? I'm going to read that. And anybody who wants to jump on this, please, by all means, jump on it. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God or 
uh, some versions say God breathed. And it says, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's a text that a lot of people go to. Anybody on the on the cast today want to take a stab at what we do with that scripture within the context of this conversation? All right, I'm gonna call on somebody. I have Myra. a thought. Okay, Boy, tyranny, to... tyranny, and Myra. Can can you read the um, the second part again? It's all uh, useful for. It's something, profitable something. for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay, so my thought that came up when you read that part after the first part, because you know you have to read the text in context, you got to read what comes before and what comes after it, all of that good jazz. And so if we can use the text for those things of like our our culture, our humanity, can we not use the text for that of the text? So like if it's good for reproof, can we not use it to reproof itself? If it's good for like doctrine, can we not use it for that on itself? And so my strain of thought is like, if it's good for correction, can we not correct it? Like if it's you, like that's the that's the thing that's coming up for me. I don't have great words because like I just thought of this right now, but that's my strain of thinking. It's like if we can use it for those things, we can do that to the text itself. I totally agree, right? Like a perfect example of that is Jesus himself. He corrected the text, the whole strand of, but I say unto you, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, he is in that moment reinterpreting scripture for the people in his audience. Myron, what you got? You know, I, I, I've got two thoughts here. So my first thought is that I think we shouldn't read the text literally. We should read the text uh, literally, right? Like literature as opposed to literally. Uh, and when we read literature, we look at the genre of which literature is written in. And ultimately we need to look at the genre of which the text is written in to better understand the text. So if the book of Psalms is written poetically, as po I've got to realize that it's using the methodology of poetry to get its point across, that it's not trying to give me something literal to do or to say, it's using genre. Right. And we need to interpret the text via genre. Um, the next thought is I, and I've, I've got to expand this idea. And, and y'all probably have heard me say this before, that I think the text uh, is made up of two things. I think it's it's full of methods. Right. Of, of how we approach God and approach the divine. But I also think that the pro, the text is full of mirrors uh, and is showing us how to approach ourselves. I saw this so clearly yesterday. Yesterday, uh, my Bible reading was, I think, in the book of Second Kings, when it talked about the famine uh, and everyone was hoarding the food, uh, and so much so that uh, a pile of dung people were selling for an exorbitant rate because people were eating it because they were hoarding it. Uh, and then I opened the front page of the newspaper, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, and people were hoarding gas. And gas that should have been $3 was $5. The text became a mirror to let us know that sometimes we as humans have the proclivity to scare ourselves so much that we hoard things when we should be sharing things. And ultimately, the problem would be ameliorated or eliminated. I knew it was coming. I knew it. He let you get away with a couple, I think. Oh, I said, well deserved. All right, I'll pay. The problem would be eliminated if we would share instead of hoard, right? So it's full of methods and it's full of mirrors. So that's what I think. Don't give him a, a mic drop. Don't give him one for that, please. He's way too, way too far ahead. I mean... <laughs> that was good, man. Another, another great uh, comment in, in the chat was from Grace and the Pundit. He said, genre matters. So don't bring hip hop expectations to heavy metal concerts. Right. You can't you can't go to to a, a, a Guns N' Roses concert expecting Jay-Z. <laughs> it's just not the same thing. It's two totally different concepts. Anybody else? Nikki, Karima, either of you have any thoughts on Second Timothy three and 16? I'll read it for you again. 
so you can have it you know at the top of your brain and we're going to wrap this up in just a moment and go to the after party second timothy three sixteen says all scripture is given by inspiration of god or god breathed and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness does anybody know, so myron you have to help me on this one first timothy was written probably in 90 a.d second or second timothy was probably written in 90 ish a.d right so the scripture they're talking about is probably hebrew scripture is that fair to assume they're not in like the New Testament Greek scripture was not widely circulated at this point. I really, those yeah. of you who listen to your MDiv are going to have to tell me if I'm right about that. So that's one thing to think about that the, the context of this is they're talking about Hebrew scripture, which Christianity will often refer to as the Old Testament. So that's one thing to think about. But the other thing to think about is God breathed into humanity. And we are walking around in this world and he is the one who wrote the scripture. So I don't think it has to be wrong. I think it can be God breathed because it came from humans and we carry around in ourselves God's breath. Nikki, you are so on. What does the, the text say? We are living epistles, read of yes. all men. You're right on. That's good. Yes. And that's right back to what Karima said earlier about where she sees Jesus in this world. Where is the divine? It's in her. It's in me. It's in you. Which I'm leads so me jealous. to what Tyranny said in the chat. When Tyranny said, I think we have to expand our view of sacred texts. The word of God is found in several places. So that verse applies to all of the say there is only one God. There is only one God and there is only one humanity through whom God breathed into all humanity. So the same Christian text, the same Buddhist text, the same whatever text is all God inspired. And when taken all together, it is a beautiful reflection of who we in our humanity, how we reflect the, the divine. Gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. That is beautiful. And so I want to I want to drop something right here as we start to wrap up. If you're listening and you agree with what Karima just said, there is only one God. You have within yourself just contradicted portions of scripture. Because that wasn't always the belief in scripture. This belief of one God, that that wasn't the belief. Abraham. You got to get yeah. Abraham first. Yeah, you go back like in, in ancient Israelite culture, particularly Old Testament times, the Torah, the belief before the children of Israel went into Babylonian exile, we don't have time to do a whole church history or Bible history lesson. The belief was that there are multiple gods, but our God is supreme. That's why they would call God King of Kings and Lord of Lords, because they believed that there were multiple gods, but our God is superior. So our whole belief that there is one God, if you agree with what Karima said, you yourself have just contradicted scripture. So I want you to sit with that. See how it makes you feel. And just get comfortable with the fact that you are the living word of God. In you resides the word of God. You are a walking word of God. I want to say this and then we'll go to the after party because I still want to hear uh, what you all's thoughts are about like some of the cultural challenges to healthily engaging the Bible. But I do want to say this about 2 Timothy 3 and 16. And this goes to what Nikki was saying just a moment ago. If we look at 2 Timothy 3 and 16 within its context, and again, Jeremiah, thank you for this question because we had no intention on going this direction. This is the beauty of being in the Patreon community. You might completely push the conversation in a different direction. If I always say, if you take a text out of its context, it's just a kind. So we have to look at 2 Timothy 3 and 16 within its context. The writer is writing a letter to an individual in a particular time frame where there was no New Testament. So this letter was not considered scripture at the time it was written. 
when the writer of Second Timothy wrote Second Timothy, he didn't sit down to write scripture. <laughs> he sat down to write a letter. Later on, some people came along and said, wow, this is really good. We should include this in our sacred text. So if we look at it for what it says, the writer of Second Timothy is referring to what he knew as scripture at the time. At the time he wrote it, he was referring to the Torah, what we know as the Old Testament. Now, we love to talk about how vengeful the guy was in the Old Testament and all these different things. And my Old Testament professor, Dave Garber, would eat you up if you said that in his presence. But we love to talk about that. All of the vengeance, all of the genocide, all of the violence. Well, that is the scripture that the writer of Second Timothy was referring to. So if you look at those scriptures, for example, some of what, the, let's just take one story. When the prophet Samuel goes to King Saul and says, this is the command of the Lord. I want you to go and commit genocide against the Amalekites. Not I want you to defend yourself against the Amalekites because they're coming to attack you. No, I want you to invade Amalekite territory. I want you to kill everybody, men, women, children, and infants. I'm not making this up. This is in your Bible. Samuel said, God told the Israelites, kill men, women, children, and infants. He said, this is the command of the Lord because of how their ancestors opposed your ancestors when you were coming out of Egypt. Tell me how that is God breathed. Tell me what is God saying? If that's really what God said, what does that say to us today? I think we need to sit with all of that when we come to scripture and not proof text something like 2 Timothy 3 and 16 and apply it across the board because the reality is 2 Timothy 3 and 16 doesn't apply to the gospels because there were no gospels. There was no New Testament. So we got to look at everything in context. Listen, this has been great. I love it. So when we go to the after party, we're going to talk about what are some of the cultural challenges to healthily engage. Wait, wait, you just going to ignore that mic drop after you've been asking for mic drops all? You just going to move into the clothes? You, you not going to celebrate the dance? What, what, what happened to all of that? I'm trying to play it cool, man. I don't want to get too excited because then I might like ruin my opportunity to get more in the future. You know, I'm trying to take take a page out of your book. You know, right, like shut it down. Go ahead, run us to the end, Doc. Run us I'm, to the end. I'm trying to act like I, this happens to me all the time. You just messed up my whole flow by doing that. <laughs> Look, this has been great. We're gonna come back next time, and the topic of our next episode is an incomplete Bible. What's missing? We're going to talk about it in our next episode. If we were to add on to the end of the Bible, or if we were to add some stuff in the Bible, what would we add? Where have we heard God's voice? Where have we seen God's word that hasn't been included in our canon? That's what we're going to talk about next time. Right now, we're going to go to the after party with the patrons. Thank you all so much for being here at Holy Smokes, Cigars, and Spirituality. And we'll see you next time right here.